Hello, my name is Matthias Gottschlag, and in this video I will describe techniques for improved fair scheduling for workloads involving very power-intensive instructions, such as AVX2 or AVX512. Now, it is commonly assumed that scheduling should be fair, that individual tasks should have equal access to the CPU, mainly to provide at least some degree of performance isolation. And existing operating systems commonly allocate equal CPU time to individual tasks, which results in a very high degree of fairness as long as CPU frequencies do not fluctuate too much. In recent years, however, systems have become more and more power limited to the point where now particularly power intensive instructions such as AVX2 or AVX512 actually require the CPU to temporarily reduce its frequency. And this frequency reduction often also affects other tasks, tasks which do not use any such power intensive instructions at all. And if those tasks are slowed down, this is a problem for fairness and related work has often measured more than 15% unfairness in workloads involving AVX512. So this shows that we need to rethink the way we approach fair scheduling. And in this video, I will describe frequency reduction compensation as a very simple modification to existing fair schedulers, which is able to reduce the unfairness, for example, in workloads involving AVX512 by a factor of four. However, before I describe our approach, I first need to explain the underlying problem. The problem really is that we keep reducing the size of transistors, but we are hardly able to also scale the operating voltage of the transistors anymore, which has led to ever increasing power density and to the problem of dark silicon, where today it is completely impossible to operate a full chip at its maximum electrically possible frequency. In other words, the performance of modern CPUs is really mainly limited by their power consumption which has caused the introduction of a number of techniques which try to maximize CPU frequencies within those power limits. So for example, Intel Turbo Boost increases the frequency whenever some of the CPU cores are inactive. However, power consumption not only depends on the number of active CPU cores, it also depends on the transistor switching activity within those individual CPU cores, or in other words, on the complexity of the operations executed. So if, for example, we have a system that first executes code which only uses very low power instructions, but then there is code which uses more power intensive instructions, then ideally the system would execute the low power code at a very high frequency and the more power intensive code at a lower frequency because only this kind of frequency management actually allows the system to fully utilize its whole power budget at all points in time and to provide maximum performance for all these different types of code. And this is a behavior which can be seen in modern Intel CPUs, which provide support for AVX2 or AVX512. AVX2 and AVX512 are SIMD instruction set extensions operating on very wide 256 to 512 bit vector registers. And these wide operations, of course, increase performance and usually also energy efficiency, but they also increase power. So these CPUs actually provide three different frequency ranges. There is one very, uh, one set of very high frequencies for low power non-AVX code, uh, but AVX2 and even more so AVX512 code has to be executed at reduced frequencies. Now, this frequency reduction would not be a problem in terms of fairness if only the AVX2 or AVX512 code was affected, because this code, of course, profits from the increased parallelism brought by these instructions, which easily makes up for, the pre for any frequency drop. There are, however, two scenarios where other potentially completely unrelated code is affected as well, even if it does not use any power intensive instructions. So for example, if we have a system which first executes a task which uses many power intensive instructions, in this case, AVX512, but then there's a context switch to a task which does not use any power intensive instruction, then conceptually during the context switch, the CPU could immediately increase its frequency again. However, in practice, it does not because it does not actually know whether the next task is going to use power intensive instructions again. Instead, it waits for some time to basically implement some kind of frequency change rate limiting. But this, of course, means that the task after the context switch is actually executed at a much lower frequency than at which it could have been executed. In other words, task A slows down task B. And similarly, on a system with hyperthreading, the two hyperthreads, of course, share one CPU frequency. But that means that if one hyperthread again executes power intensive instructions such as AVX512, whereas the, ta the task on the other hyperthread does not, then the latter task again is slowed down as it is executed at a lower frequency than necessary. 
And this kind of remote slowdown, where one task slows the other down, this kind of remote frequency overhead, actually is a problem in terms of fairness, because previously we could simply assume that equal CPU time would always also result in more or less equal, let's say, relative CPU performance. So if one task was allocated 50% of the time on one CPU core, then it was fairly safe to assume that this task would be executed at exactly half as fast as if it was a load on the CPU core, which would result in very good performance isolation. In this case, however, task A slows task B down, so task B actually receives much less than its fair share of the relative CPU performance. And this really sh shows that we need to rethink the way we approach fair scheduling on these systems. Now, the left part of the figure shows the situation from the last slide, where task A causes a frequency reduction, whereas task B is affected by the frequency reduction overhead. Now, we propose reinstating this intuitive definition of fairness where all the tasks experience identical relative CPU performance, which in this case can be achieved by just giving task B slightly more CPU time, because then, even though the frequency reduction overhead was completely occurring within the time slices of task B, both tasks would actually be equally affected by the overhead. Now, when we implement this kind of scheduling, um, we need to ask ourselves what metric do we want to use for scheduling, because related work has often suggested using energy as a first-class operating system resource and to use it for scheduling. However, doing so is actually fairly difficult. We need a accurate and very fine-grained energy model, which is able to capture all these effects of these power-intensive instructions. Now, constructing such a model on current CPUs is actually impossible, and we would argue that it's probably going to be fairly difficult on future CPUs as well. So what we propose instead is to simply modify existing time-based fast scheduling, because doing so is actually fairly simple. We can just modify CPU time accounting. So if we ta take the time allocated to a task affected by frequency reduction overhead. So if we take the time slice of the task and just subtract the time lost due to fre the frequency reduction overhead, we arrive at a time that is more or less representative of the relative CPU performance experienced by the task. And if we feed that time back into an existing time-based fair scheduler, the scheduler would automatically result in a situation where all tasks have more or less equal CPU performance. So the main challenge here is to determine how much frequency reduction overhead do we have and which task, task is affected. Now, the frequency reduction overhead is basically unnecessary frequency reduction. So it can be represented by the ratio between the ideal frequency during a time slice, the frequency at which the code during the time slice could have been executed, and the actual CPU frequency during the time slice. So if, for example, we have a non-AVX task that is always executed at very low AVX 512 frequencies, um, then this ratio by which we want to scale the CPU time is just the ratio between the AVX 512 and the non-AVX frequency. If the same non-AVX task was actually always executed at high non-AVX frequencies, there would not be an, have been any slowdown at all, so we do not want to scale the CPU time. Now, in practice, we are usually going to be somewhere between those two points, um, depending on how much the, of the time slice was actually spent at reduced frequency levels. Um, so we just use performance counters to determine the ratio of time at higher and lower frequency levels. Now, this concept seems fairly simple. In practice, it becomes a bit more difficult as the frequency reduction not only depends on the time spent at the AVX 512 level, but also the time spent at the AVX 2 frequency level, um, which just adds one more dimension to the problem. And more importantly, we also need to take care about turbo boost. Um, Turbo Boost introduces a large number of additional frequency levels, depending on the number of active cores, and the problem is that the operating system does not actually know how many cores have been active during the last time slice on average. Now, if you're interested in our solution for this problem, we invite you to just have a look at the paper. So once we determined how much frequency reduction existed during a time slice, we also still need to determine whether the frequency reduction was necessary. We need to determine whether there were any power intensive instructions during the time slice, and because we only want to apply frequency reduction compensation if there were no such instruction, in, in this case AVX2 or AVX512. Now, the idea here is that these 
complex power intensive instruction set extensions probably all uh, uh, often have their own separate registers. In this case, what we do is during each context switch, we completely disable all access to the 256 and 512 bit vector registers because then the first AVX2 or AVX512 instruction, which tries to access these registers, actually generates an exception. And in the exception handler in, your, in the operating system, well, we can re-enable those registers because we want the instructions to be accessible again. Um, but we can also memorize whether the tasks used AVX2 or AVX512 so that during the next context switch, when we implement CPU time accounting, we can actually have a look at the register usage and only apply frequency reduction compensation as described on the last slides, only scale the CPU time if those registers were not used and if the frequency reduction was unnecessary. So we used those concepts to implement a prototype when we noticed one additional practical problem. When we modify CPU time accounting, suddenly we have a situation where, CPU, uh, where time flows at different speeds on different CPU cores. So if, for example, we take a task on, which is usually scheduled on a CPU, which often suffers from reduced frequencies and compare it to a task uh, on a CPU core, which always executes at maximum speed, then these two tasks, even if we apply frequency reduction compensation as described on the previous slides, still experience different relative CPU performance. So from time to time, we need to migrate tasks around to achieve some kind of global fairness. Now, usually these kinds of migrations are performed as part of the scheduler's load balancing code. We, however, noticed that the Linux completely fair schedulers load balancing was rather slow and also often discarded information about CPU time differences. So what we did instead was to use the external multi queue skip list scheduler for Linux, which is a deadline based scheduler with much faster load balancing. And we simply modified this um, scheduler to um, use the same fair scheduling algorithm as CFS. Um, now performance between MOOCs and CFS is fairly similar. So all the following benchmark results should Fair, be fairly similar to those achieved with the completely fair scheduler just modified with faster load balancing as well. So we evaluated the, uh, the resulting prototype mainly to answer two questions. First, is this actually a sensible approach to imp improve scheduling fairness? And second, if it is, how much additional overhead is introduced? Because this is code that is very frequently executed during each individual context switch. So we performed a number of experiments on a system with an Intel Xeon Gold 6130 server CPU, where we used a very wide range of benchmarks, everything from high performance computing workloads from the Parsec benchmark suite to the Nginx web server as an example for an interactive application or the Linux kernel build as a benchmark, which launches many different tasks. And we executed all of those alongside the X265 video encoder, which supports AVX2 and AVX512 and therefore causes the corresponding frequency reduction. And we measured the completion time of these benchmarks executed in parallel and calculated the unfairness as well as the overhead of frequency reduction uh, uh, compensation. Now, this plot shows the unfairness in a system with frequency reduction compensation, that's red bars, and without frequency reduction compensation, that's the yellow bars. Um, in other words, it shows the relative performance difference between those benchmarks and X265. Now, some benchmarks did not benefit that much from our prototype, but those were mainly benchmarks which have very long serial execution phases, where our prototype tried to allocate more than one CPU to the application, but the application actually could not use any additional CPU resources. For most other benchmarks, however, our prototype was able to almost completely eradicate the unfairness caused by AVX512. So on average, we saw a fourfold reduction of the unfairness. And all that came at very little cost. So this, uh, this plot shows the overhead of frequency reduction uh, compensation. And we can immediately see that for most benchmarks, there was no statistically significant overhead at all. So to summarize, complex power intensive instructions have the potential to reduce frequencies both, both on current Intel CPUs, as well as probably most future CPUs as well. And this frequency reduction often also affects other uh, applications would do not use any power intensive instructions, which is a problem in terms of fairness. So we need to rethink the way we approach fair scheduling. And in this work, we presented frequency reduction compensation as a very simple modification to existing fair schedulers 
which is able to reduce the unfairness in workloads involving ADX512 by a factor of 4. With this, I conclude my talk, and if you have any further questions, feel free to ask during the conference session.